Hey, everybody, it's Megan Alexander from Inside Edition, and you're listening to Life After the Crown with Tim Tialdo. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Life After the Crown podcast, where each episode I bring you interviews with former pageant contestants, title holders, and women of influence who are now succeeding across many different industries in the real world. My name is Tim Tialdo, TV and pageant host, entrepreneur, author, and somebody who just wants to help you become better. Now, if you're wondering what life looks like after pageants, the advice, the stories, and the interviews that you hear on this podcast will not only inspire you, but help make your transition from pageants to professional life a bit easier to handle. So if this is your first time listening, thanks for tuning in. We're glad you're with us. Let's get started. My guest today is a national news correspondent, author, speaker, and actress. She can be seen every evening as a correspondent on the longest-running, top-rated national news magazine show, Inside Edition. She was Miss Washington Preteen in 1993, competed in Miss Washington USA, and also judged Miss Texas USA the year Crystal Stewart won, who obviously went on to win Miss USA that year. In 2014 and 15, she covered Thursday Night Football on CBS for two seasons, And as an actress and producer, her film credits include the roles in the movies Space Warriors, Redeemed, Heartbeats, and in the television dramas Nashville on ABC and Still the King on CMT. She hosts the nationally televised Inspirational Country Music Awards each year from Nashville, Tennessee. And her first book, Faith in the Spotlight, Thriving in Your Career While Staying True to Your Beliefs, was released by Simon & Schuster in 2016. She now splits time between New York City and Nashville, Tennessee, and she and her husband have two sons and a dog named Indiana. Megan Alexander, you are a woman of many talents and a storied career. Welcome to the show. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me. Yeah, what a what an awesome uh, bio there. My gosh, you've done it quite a bit. So I, I want to ask you, so how is it working in the national media these days? Uh, Inside Edition, you know, from my standpoint, always looked like such a fun show to work on. So what's it been like? Yeah, you know, Tim, I think our strength, especially today, is that we still give people variety. In a news media world where it feels like political stories are on 24-7 and there's so much division and tension, we still show cute little puppies. (laughs) We still um, share inspirational medical stories. We cover sports. We cover business. Um, And I think people really enjoy escaping for 30 minutes and tuning into our show. Yes, you'll get a little bit of politics and a little bit of hard news, but I think that's been a key to our success 25 years later. um, The show's been on the air for 25 years, that we give people variety. Well, with what you mentioned, I mean, it is a politically divisive atmosphere out there. Is it hard not to take that nosedive into that side of things for, you know, when you guys get into your editorial meetings and talk about the day? Yes, because televisions are on 24-7 in our newsroom, and it's hard to miss it nowadays, the front page of newspapers. But we really do balance the show. I mean, we comment on what Melania wore at the state dinner and give people a fashion story instead of diving into the bitter politics. So yes and no, and I appreciate that we try to bring some levity to the situation. Sure. Well, hey, you've been on, uh, you know, national news media for about a decade now, and it's in a television career these days, that's a very successful run. So I'd love to kind of go back. I always love to hear about people's story of how they got there. And I was reading about how as a five-year-old, you were given the chance to hone your craft and personality on the radio. Can you tell that story? Yes. So at five years old, my kindergarten class took a field trip to the local radio station, which was actually located across the the street from my elementary school. And we got to watch the DJs talk and mix music. And I just thought, I want to do something like this. And the DJ said, does anybody want to be on the radio? And I don't remember this, but my kindergarten teacher said that I raised my hand and said, I do. And I talked a little bit into the microphone and I just was captivated and said, I want to do something in this industry. And then it was really when I was 13 years old and I was in my very first pageant that I needed to define, you know, my career goals and my ambition. And that's when I said, I want to be a sportscaster. I want to do something in front of people in the entertainment industry. So what was it about sports? Because, you know, if I look back, you know, at my childhood around that same age, you know, I used to watch like Entertainment Tonight and I would think, you know, God, I want to do something like that. What, what sport or what, you know, show did you watch that you said, man, that just fits my style? 
Yeah, you know, I played sports my whole life, so I think it was first just just being an athlete and being a fan, um, enjoying the hype that goes into a game. We watch tennis a lot as a family, and I just enjoy the commentary, whether it was Chris Everett, who's, you know, called those matches for forever. Um, I think it was more just the presentation of it all and realizing, gosh, this is in the 90s, that there were not a lot of females that were in sports. I mean, Robin Roberts and Hannah Storm, I loved their presentation. I don't know if you remember this, Tim, oh, yeah. but Hannah Storm used to give the NBC Skybox update on flights when we didn't have our phones, we didn't have our computers, and we would just have television screens you know, on, on flights when you were up in the skies. And I just loved her presentation. Her and Robin Roberts, I thought, were, were so fantastic. So they inspired me, and I just wanted to be a part of the excitement. Yeah, I do remember that. And that, you know, they were one of very few at the time. So, you know, they were very recognizable. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, Hannah Storm is not a name you really forget. So you mentioned that you had you competed in that first pageant. I think you said you were 13 years old. Um, uh, I believe it was the American co-ed pageant. Talk about that first experience in pageants for you. That's right. My mother got a flyer in the mail. Someone had referred us to the program and she said, Meg, is this something you'd want to do? And, you know, like I said, I was an athlete. I you know, was involved in school plays and music, but I'd never done a pageant before. And we said, let's give it a try. And so I tried it. I got my clothes together. Um, I remember showing up and it was a huge pageant. And there was like 200 contestants. And it was just so much fun. It was so different to get dressed up, to learn how to present yourself to the audience, to interview one-on-one with the judges. And I think what was important for me and what really stands out to me is filling out the application which was sort of my first experience at age 13, filling out a resume. And they said, list your school activities, list your career ambition. And that's a moment where you go, gosh, what do I want to be when I grow up? So it was just really cool. I was really inspired by the whole environment. That was when I was in junior high. And it was a time to be around like-minded young women, which is so needed in those years. I, you know, like so many people, I was a little bit lonely in junior high. And at the pageant, I remember thinking, I'm around all these girls where it's cool to have goals. It's cool to try to look our best and feel our best and share our dreams and what we want to be one day. So that was just an atmosphere that I loved and I couldn't wait to come back the next year. So outside of the application itself, how did, you know, pageantry shape your preparation for a career in broadcast journalism? Definitely taking that microphone and getting on stage (laughs) and looking into the eyes of everyone in the audience and hearing your voice in that microphone for the first time. It's addicting. It really was addicting for me. And then, and then watching, you know, the, the DVD of the pageant afterwards and, and looking at your presentation and, you know, wondering how to, you know, how did I do? How do I sound? Um, That was a moment for me was, was definitely saying, I want to do something where the microphone can be my tool for my career. Well, and you definitely did that not only in, you know, broadcast journalism, but I understand that you uh, emceed some of the, uh, I believe, the National American Miss pageants. Yes. So I was in the pageant the first year, and then I came back my second year and won and um, attended the national pageant and started noticing that so many of the staff members were former queens, which is typical in, in the pageant system. And when I turned 16, I asked if I could join the staff and um, judged and sort of helped out part time for a while. And then when I turned 18, um, a wonderful couple named Steve and Kathleen Mays, who went on to found, they went on to found the National American Miss Pageant. They hired me as one of their MCs, and I got to host pageants all over the country for them and talk for a living. Do you still do that? I don't do it as much. I, I wish I could do it more. Um, I think the last time I emceed a pageant was two years ago. Okay. My husband and I were actually directors for National American Miss uh, for, gosh, almost eight years. And then with having two little children, the travel just became a little too much. But I will state right now, if anybody wants to hire me as an MC, I would love to do it again. It's so much fun. (laughs) Well, I'm sure they would love to have you. Now, you were speaking about your husband. I understand that pageants had a big role in how you met him. Can you tell that story? Yeah. So we met at that American co-ed pageant. Um, His neighbor's sister won the Miss Washington teen title um, that year. And so he came just, you know, a part of her entourage, her family and friends. And so we met, I was 13, he was 14. We didn't start dating until our early twenties, but how ironic is that, that we actually met there. And it's really cool that we met there, Tim, because he immediately knew what this pageant thing was all about. He thought it was cool. He understood 
how motivating the environment was. And it was never something that I had to explain to him. And he went on to, uh, to work for them as well as a state director because he believed in it too. Very cool. Very cool. And now you've, you've explored kind of all different aspects of pageantry, you know, everything from a contestant to a director to an MC. Um, in 2008, you judged the Miss Texas USA pageant, as we mentioned in the beginning. Uh, your panel chose Crystal Stewart. Uh, great choice, by the way, because she went on to win Miss USA. Uh, what was the difference for you uh, from being a contestant and an MC and a, and a director compared to being a judge? Oh, gosh, it was hard. Um, it was really, really hard. But I will tell you, Tim, that we knew in interview who our winner was. I will never forget Crystal coming into that interview room. And we asked her why she was doing the pageant. And she looked us in the eye and she said, I want to win Miss Universe. She was so confident, obviously a beautiful girl. But it struck all of us. And we thought, this, this is it. This is the girl. So it's hard. It's difficult. But it's also such a wonderful experience because I was so inspired by all of these girls and all their dreams. Um, and all the judges have always shared that. So it's difficult to choose one when there's so many qualified ladies. But I do think as a judge, there comes a time when sort of the most qualified ladies rise to the top, if that makes sense. Mm, and oh yeah. then it's, it's just, you know, figuring out who's the right fit um, that year. Well, and you're talking about Texas. I mean, how many contestants did you have to interview that day? Al and Gail Clark were the state directors for Texas, and it was televised, Tim, all across the state of Texas. I don't know if it still is, but it was a huge deal. I think there were over 100 contestants, and they had many of them had gone through preliminary pageants. I mean, that Texas USA system is so big that they often hold, you know, preliminary county pageants for USA oh, yeah. to even get there. Yeah, so it was a huge deal um, and very, very competitive. I mean, so many girls often competed for years and years, and we can see why they do so well. So many of them go on to win Miss USA or Miss Universe. So it was an awesome experience, a very classy production. No doubt, no doubt. Well, hey, you had a chance to be featured on the cover of Pageantry Magazine not too long ago. Um, you share that distinction with some pretty famous former pageant contestants, people like Lisa Gibbons, Deborah Norville, Eva Longoria. What's it like to know that you've been successful enough in your career uh, to earn that honor and be a cover model for pageantry? I was so excited when Carl Dunn called me. I still remember I was walking up the sidewalk in New York City near my office, Midtown West, and I remember getting the phone call and he asked me if I would be on the cover of that fall issue of Pageantry Magazine. And I was so thrilled because, Tim, I, re I read that magazine forever. You know, the minute I was in that pageant as a 13-year-old, I started getting those magazines in the mail. I subscribed and I'm such a big follower and a fan of the magazine. So I was really thrilled and I'm a big believer in giving back. Um, and if my story could inspire somebody else, I wanted to share it. I wanted to sing the praises of the two pageants that I've been involved in, American Co-Ed and National American Miss, because they're huge youth pageants that are doing such a great job um, bringing a lot of values and um what would you say? They're natural pageants that don't put a lot of emphasis on hair and makeup. They don't have swimsuit. Just a different type of a pageant that I think is important for young girls. So I was thrilled to share my story. And um, I love the network and the community that the pageant world um, has and love hearing even to this day from girls who have been in pageants and have gained confidence and gone on to do things they never imagined because they had that opportunity to put their best foot forward. Well, and you basically represent the end result of what a lot of young women want to be today who are in pageantry. They want to get into broadcast journalism. They want to get on a show like Inside Edition or maybe work the sidelines for the NFL or do some sort of sports reporting. So for, you know, all those girls listening who basically want to be either you or some version of you, what advice would you have for them on getting into the career that you're in? I would say, first of all, you're, you're taking a great step by being in a pageant getting on that stage, speaking in a microphone, learning how to interview with someone and present yourself and define your goals, that is huge. We don't see that offered, Tim, in other ways in society if you're not involved in pageants. I mean, some people get it through church. Some might get it through a speech and debate program. But I think pageants are so important for that, for that factor of gaining confidence and presenting your, yourself to the world. Um, I would say to them, get involved in a lot of different activities in life. In addition to pageants, try out for that school play, 
try out for student council, continue getting up in front of people, giving speeches, presenting yourself, go to the best college you can, network, go to events and network and talk to people. For my particular industry, internships are very important. So I always encourage girls, whether it's the local radio station, TV station, a blog that you're a fan of, a magazine publication, Contact those people and ask them if you can be an intern or if you can shadow someone for a day and really get some on-the-job experience. Um, As a sophomore in high school, I got the opportunity to shadow the local evening news anchor in Seattle, Washington, where I grew up. And that was huge for me to watch her handle breaking news, to sit on the set. And I believe so much in that that I try to give back at least twice a year. I allow someone to come shadow me at Inside Edition or to come on the red carpet with me. I've offered that to, you know, other pageant girls that have reached out to me. And if I can't do it, I try to get them hooked up with somebody else in the industry that will allow that. I'm a big believer in that on-the-job experience and not giving up. You know, Tim, I have sent out resumes and cover letters and emails to more people than I can count. And you're going to get a lot of no's and a lot of rejections in this industry. But for, you know, say you send out 10 letters and you get nine no's just when you're about to give up, you'll get that yes. You'll get that 10th email back that says, yes, we're interested. So don't give up. Keep after it. Well, let's talk about Inside Edition because that's obviously, it's a big deal. I mean, that's a great show to be on. It's one of the you know most successful news magazine shows in the history of television. How did you get that job? I think that's what one, most people want to know. Like, do you have an agent or was it something where you just sent in your cover, cover letter and resume and got a response? I'd love to, to kind of hear the story. This is a great story, Tim. <laughs> so I was a local news anchor in San Antonio, Texas. I started in radio in Nashville, Tennessee and doing some different country music videos and acting. And then I got a job as a morning traffic reporter in San Antonio and also started co-hosting a morning show down there called Great Day SA, which is kind of like a local Good Morning America. And I'd been there for about three, three years and I heard just through websites and blogs that I subscribed to, I had heard Um, that Inside Edition was looking for a West Coast correspondent. And I did have an agent, um, but I had found this out on my own. So I contacted my agent and said, hey, I hear Inside Edition is looking for a West Coast reporter. Maybe I could get back to the West Coast. My family is all in Seattle. Their L.A. bureau is looking for somebody. And Tim, my agent said to me, and I quote, you're not their look. You don't stand a chance. This is a waste of time. <laughs> that sounds like an agent. Well, I had, <laughs> so I, I had been raised that you should always try to get advice from someone. My dad told me growing up, listen, anybody that you admire in life, buy him a cup of coffee, ask him for 15 minutes of their time to pick their brain, ask him a question, you know, Do whatever you can to rub elbows with people of excellence and greatness because it'll tend to brush off on you. And so I said to my agent, well, what about if we just send my resume and my resume tape and just get some feedback? I'd love it if Inside Edition even gave me feedback on my video reel. And the agent literally sighed and said, all right, we'll send it. But I'm telling you, they're not going to be interested. Well, Tim... 24 hours later, I got a phone call from my agent. She said, Megan, the executive producer of that show, wants to fly you to New York. He loves your tape. And I'm telling you, Megan, they're going to hire you. And she started laughing. (laughs) And I said, great. Tim, this is a true story. And I said, great, let's go for it. So I flew to New York, interviewed for Inside Edition. And my boss now, who's been my boss for 10 years, just an incredible guy, the executive producer of our show, He said to me, Megan, I want you in New York. I don't want you in L.A. I want you here at the home base, the hub, which is here in New York City. And they made me an offer and hired me. And Tim, I will say, I let go of that agent. (laughs) (laughs) I hope hope they didn't get a commission out of that either. (laughs) Um, We ended up working something out, but that was a moment where you got to be with people that have confidence in you. And Tim, what about if I had said, oh, never mind, let's not send my tape to Inside Edition. What about if I'd taken her advice? So to all those ladies listening, send the email, send the tape, ask for feedback. You never know. You just might get a job out of it. I did. That is a true 
story verbatim. What an awesome, what an awesome <laughs> story and what an awesome lesson learned for that agent. By the way, did you take another agent after that or have you stayed independent since you've had the job? I stayed independent for quite a while. Um, I got a publicist a couple of years ago when my book came out and that was a good fit for me. Um, I do have an entertainment attorney now that I work with, but I found him that I get a lot of my gigs on my own or just working with someone, you know, in in partnership and um, a publicist has been a little bit better fit. There are great agents out there and the entertainment attorney that I'm working with, um, he basically is an agent. You just have to find someone that's a good fit, that believes in you and it's a partnership. You're both doing the work. It's 50-50 and bottom line, you got to be with someone who will dream big with you. Yeah, I love that advice. I was actually just talking to Olivia Jordan who's doing acting last week about the same thing, about just finding an agent that really, you know, meshes with you, that doesn't give you that speech that your last agent gave you, which was, oh, you're not the look that they're looking for. I don't think it's a good idea. Exactly. Yeah. And listen, I would also add that constructive criticism is important. This is a competitive industry. You know that, Tim. You're going to get a lot of rejection. So yes, you need somebody that will also shoot you straight and, you know, give you criticism when you need it. But it's that balance that they will still, you know, they'll be willing to send your tape, even if they don't think it's a fit because it's something that is important to you. So it's finding that balance. Well, hey, you've had the chance to host the Inspirational Country Music Awards in Nashville. I believe you split New York and Nashville as a home. Um, And that's a dream job for a lot of people. How did you land that gig and maybe some of the highlights that you remember most from doing it? Yeah, the Inspirational Country Music Awards, I have been involved with those guys now for eight years. It is a cross of country music and Christian gospel music, which is just a really neat genre. I mean, we've had everyone from Winona Judd, Jason Crabb, um, a lot of the American Idol, Idol winners like Scotty McCreary grace the stage. Um, John Schneider is co-hosting this year with me. Everybody knows him from Dukes of Hazard and most recently Dancing with the Stars. And oh, he's yeah. got a great country music career. Yeah, so it's a gr- it's a great group of people. Um, they've gone through a change in leadership these past couple years, and they're trying to really really hone in on this market that is inspirational country music. Um, music with a message. And that's a lot of country music anyways, you know, talking about life, talking about faith and family and country. So yeah, I got involved, I got involved with those guys eight years ago because they asked me to present in the very first show. And, and then it went well. And they said, the second year, would you like to co-host? And I said, let's do it. Let's go. (laughs) And it's so much fun. Um, (laughs) I love the production of, I, I love the production of a live show. You know, there's nothing like it. And you know, music, I think, is so important in life. It speaks to our feelings and our journey and um, what we're going through. So being a part of the industry is just fun. And what venue do they do that at in Nashville? We film it at the Grand Ole Opry. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's a great venue to be at. Awesome. Well, hey, I want to talk about your book because I'm a huge fan of it. Um, I had just a chance to jump online and read the first chapter. It's called Faith in the Spotlight, Thriving in Your Career While Staying True to Your Beliefs. Now, this is a message that you know, as a male, I try to put out to the world as well. And I just love how you have done it. Um, It's a fantastic topic in today's culture because, you know, personally, as someone who is not shy about sharing my faith publicly, uh, we live in a world that isn't always very receptive to that. Um, So I want you to talk about what you share with women in the book and, you know, how it translates to what you've done in your career. Yeah, you know, the idea came about, Tim, because I received so many emails from young women that are curious about this industry, specifically girls who have faith, who've been raised, you know, whether it's in a Christian household or just a strong household of faith, and they want to pursue big dreams and goals, but they're not sure if they'll need to compromise their their values to get there. And sort of the, the push for me, the final push to write this book was an email I got a couple of years ago from a pastor in Seattle. He wrote to me and he said, Megan, I have a church full of young, ambitious women of faith. They have big goals and dreams, but they're terrified they're going to need to compromise themselves. They see people in media and on television who are portraying an image that they don't want to be a part of, but they're worried they're going to need to do that to be successful. He said, I've heard of you. Will you come speak to these women? And Tim, that was me yesterday. That was me sitting in church with those goals and dreams, wanting to do television and also wanting to remain true to my faith. And so I put pen to paper and I started coming up with different chapters. I'm a big believer in practical advice. There are so many books out there that are inspirational and motivational, and I love them, 
but I want to pick the brain of people and find out specifically what did you do? How did you get from point A to point B? And being that I'm in my mid-30s, I don't have all the answers. I realize I haven't lived a super long full life. So I went and asked some of my friends to contribute. Um, Devon Franklin wrote one of the forewords to one of the chapters. I asked Kirk Cousins, quarterback for the Redskins. He, now he's with the Vikings. I asked him to write a forward to my chapter on covering the NFL. Um, Gabby Douglas, Olympic gold medalist, who I covered Super Bowl 48 with. I asked her to write a chapter about, you know, re- remaining true to your faith when she was, in a, you know, competing in the Olympics. So I gathered all these people to give their insight. And then I try to give takeaways at the end of the chapter I share vulnerable stories, things that have happened to me on set, on the job, how I approached it, why I made the decision I did. And um, it hopefully can serve as a guidebook for this next generation. You know, they, they're going to be the leaders of tomorrow before we know it. And I would have loved a book like this when I was growing up and, and entering the industry. So like I said, I'm a big believer in paying it forward and giving back. And it was really fun to do. I loved putting it together and I enjoy the feedback that I get from young women and men who read it and maybe just get that extra push to not give up and go after their dreams. And I love the message that you give because, you know, when you talk about compromising in today's media with females, I think, you know, pretty much what we're mainly talking about here is the whole sex sells mentality. And I think a lot of girls, you know, I I host pageants in the South and a lot of those girls are deep in their faith. And I think they feel that same way that how am I going to do this and still be a a woman of God or a Proverbs 31 type woman and and do what I want to do when everybody's going to tell me that I got to either take my clothes off or be more revealing or be more uh, sexy about the way I approach things. I'm sure you've dealt with that in your journey uh, being in the national media. That is an excellent question. And that is one of the chapters in my book where I talk about a time when I was asked to wear a dress for a specific story we were doing and I felt uncomfortable. And so what did I do? And I talk about how I worked the problem and was able to compromise in a way that still made me feel good about my choice and yet delivered for the show. And that's very much real life. You know, if you're gonna, it's going to be a quick moment, a split decision. You won't have time to call a friend. You won't have time to email your pastor and get advice, you know, you'll be under deadline and you'll have to make a decision within five minutes. So I I share those stories in the book. I also um, brought my friends Shane and Christina Nierman into the book. They offer a great foreword. They are the founders of an organization called Models for Christ. They now call it G-Moda. And Christina has been on the cover of Vogue and Shane has um, modeled for Hugo Boss and you name it. And they also share stories about looking at the work that you do and realizing that you are autographing your work with every image you post, with every job you accept, with what you decide to do or not do, you're leaving an impression on the world. And especially today, Tim, those images remain forever. That video will remain forever. So what image are you portraying? And just getting, you know, asking those questions of young people, asking them, what is your mission statement? What do you stand for? I tell people, you need to know who you are before you get into this industry. Try to figure out what you will and won't do before you get here. So when you're on set and there are hundreds of eyeballs staring at you when you're being asked to do something, you already have an idea of what you're going to decide. I just watched an interview with you on the CBN network. And it's probably the one thing that I can tell you I'm, I'm the most proud of you for doing. And it's something that is incredibly difficult to do in today's world. And that is you practiced abstinence and you waited until marriage. And it's something that, you know, I think culturally is almost perceived as a joke in many circles these days. But you are someone who waited. And, you know, if you could speak about, you know, how you did that, obviously your husband's role, um, you know, who was your fiance at the time in that and just how it all kind of came together and how you were able to, I guess, quote unquote, stick it out and get there. You know, Tim, I honestly believe that I was too busy chasing my career to chase boys. That is the truth. (laughs) Once I was in that pageant at age 13, I had so many goals and dreams. I stayed involved in activities in school, you know, whether it was student council, sports, school plays, and same with college. I kept myself so busy with dreams and ideas and programs that I think that's one way I was able to stay out of trouble. So that's one piece of advice that I give to girls is stay busy, engage with like-minded people. They will encourage you. You know, I tried to develop friendships with people that believe the same things I did. I'm certainly a fan of having a 
wide circle of friends and, you know, not everybody needs to be the same, but have those close friends that will encourage you and that believe the same thing. Um, so that was a big part of it for me. The second was valuing myself, valuing who I was, what I had to offer, um, believing that I was worth the wait. I think pageants are get you there because they cause us to value ourselves and present ourselves in our best way, know that we are special and unique. I mean, all that language comes from pageants and hearing all that, it, it instills in your soul and you believe it. So that was another big part of it is just knowing that I had something to offer and I was special. And I so want to share that with every young woman. Let her know that, you know, she is beautiful. She is worth it. And to take your time, you know, take your time when you're dating people and, uh, you know, have like-minded interests. That's another one is Brian and I, my husband, you know, like I said, he knew of the pageants. He knew they were important to me. The minute we started dating, he knew my career was the number one focus in my life. And he was either going to be supportive or he wasn't. So who are you dating? Do they believe in your dreams? And then it's, um, you know, it's having friends that will hold you accountable. And uh, I got to tell you, Tim, though, honestly, it wasn't as hard as you think, because when you have your end goal in mind, we talked about how important it was for us to wait to get to that moment, you know, at our wedding where, where we could, you know, say that we did. Um, and then listen, if you don't to any of those girls out there that haven't, that's OK, too. Um, there's always a chance for a fresh start. And, and just remember that, look, this was one thing that was important to me. Um, and you need to you need to define in your life what's important to you. What are the things that you value and what do you place great emphasis on? So I will say it's been um, important to us. I think marriage is difficult in this world. And it was just one more thing that hopefully solidified and continues to solidify our marriage when the times get tough, um, that we know we want to be together. And like you said, we stuck it out and, and, and sacrificed to get there. I think the one thing, I, it sounds like you surrounded yourself with some really good people, which I'm, I'm sure, you know, helps the battle. But did you ever face that peer pressure from other girls that you're a virgin? What are you kidding? Are you kidding me? This is 2018 or 19 or whatever. Did you ever kind of face those conversations where you had to either defend yourself or figure a way out of it? Yes, absolutely. Especially working in media. <laughs> um, it's, it's very unusual. If you want to silence a room in New York City, start talking about abstinence. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. So, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But again, it was knowing that it was important to me. And I would say for me, a pivotal moment for me was in high school when my Christian high school invited a couple back. They had graduated from our school, so an alumni couple who also believed in abstinence and they were dating and they shared their story. And I remember being in the room and it was a little bit uncomfortable. Here they were talking about all these things. And then I remember they opened it up for questions and they let us ask them absolutely anything we wanted to. And so, Tim, I know that that inspired me in that moment back in high school to say, gosh, I want that. I want to be able to say I waited. It was important to me. I valued myself. I, you know, looked for a partner that believed in those things. And so for me, as I got older, I remember saying, I'm willing to be uncomfortable too. And that's why I shared my story. When my pastor's wife in New York City, many years later, asked me if I'd be on the cover of a magazine and talk about why I waited. I remember talking to my husband about it. And we both said, those people so long ago in my high school were willing to be uncomfortable and share their stories and look what it did for me and how it inspired us. I need to be willing to be uncomfortable too and share my story if it inspires one person. And Tim, it never fails. Every time I talk about it, I get settled me aside and says, thank you. I'm waiting too. And I didn't think anybody was waiting anymore. Thank you so much for the encouragement. That's why yeah. you share. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of girls out there that probably would say the same thing right now. But hey, massive respect, a thousand percent respect for you for enduring, I think is probably a good word to say, um, and, and just being a great example for young women out there. So good for you. Thank you. I would love to know, where's your career going from here? I mean, you, you've had a really successful career so far. I mean, you know, you're, you're a, a, a known name and face. You're on a national news magazine show. I mean, what kind of aspirations do you have from here? Gosh, I really don't know anymore, Tim. Our, our industry is changing so quickly. I do have a couple of podcasts that are really fun right now. 
I, I do a podcast called Women Talk Sport, and it's three women across the country. Um, Farron Benjamin, who's in L.A., who's an agent for NFL stars and college players that are going into the draft. And then Jenny Hogan, who's based in Salt Lake City, Utah. She's um, a phenomenal news reporter and went on to work for the Tennis Channel and all these different things. The three of us do a weekly sports podcast called Women Talk Sport, which is really fun. I'm working on a second book, a children's book called One More Hug, which will be out in fall of 2019. And I wrote a song, a children's lullaby that will accompany the book. And it's um, the story of me and my two little boys. And the fact that my son, whenever he gets on this, my oldest son, whenever he gets on the bus, he always calls back for one more hug. And it's become, you know, a thing for us. I always, my husband and I say to him, there's always time for one more hug. And he'll get like five (laughs) hugs before he gets on the bus. So that children's book is coming out this fall, which I'm really excited about. And, you know, beyond that, I don't totally know, Tim. I'm sort of enjoying being in the moment right now. And just seeing what happens next. I love speaking. When my book came out, Faith in the Spotlight, I've had an opportunity now to speak a lot across the country, whether it's conferences, women's groups, churches, youth group, prayer breakfast. And I really love that. So I'm hoping I'll get a chance to keep speaking because that's been a wonderful new blessing of the past couple of years because of the book. Well, gosh, you're certainly covering all aspects of being in media. I mean, you're a national correspondent, host. Uh, sideline reporter, author, speaker, podcast host. I mean, you really can't do much more, so great for you. And it sounds like you've got an exciting career ahead, regardless if you have an exact vision for it uh, or not right now. Hey, at this point, at the end of every interview, I like to do some rapid-fire, get-to-know-you questions. It's kind of a little speed-round thing. It's all totally for fun, so if you'd be willing to answer 10 quick questions, then we'll be done. Sure, let's do it. All right, you ready? Here we go. Number one, do you like texting or talking better? Talking. Why? Oh, face-to-face interaction, feelings, emotions. I mean, texting, it's so easy to, you know, misunderstand what somebody is saying. So, yes, it's easy and it's quick, but I love face-to-face. All right, talking it is. Number two, what's your favorite day of the week? Um, I, I don't mind Mondays. There's something about a fresh Monday kicking off that week. Let's go. Um, probably Sunday or Monday. I'm going to guess you're in the minority on that one, but I like that answer. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number three, favorite city in the U.S. besides the one or ones that you live in? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, I live in New York City. I know. See, I live in New York City and Nashville, Tennessee, and by far, I think they're the two greatest cities in the world. But I love New Orleans, Louisiana. I covered Super Bowl Forty Seven in New Orleans, and it was absolutely incredible. I love the history down there, the food, the music, probably New Orleans. Number four, is there a nickname that your parents used to call you by? Maggie. Maggie. My mom used to call me um, Maggie and Sleepy Jean because my middle name's Jean. And she'd always sing the, oh, oh not the Beatles, but the um, the monkey song. Yes. Cheer up, Sleepy Jean. I do remember that. She used to sing that to me. Okay. Number five, yeah. last song you downloaded. Um, oh goodness. Um, honestly, probably without you by Victory Church. It, we sang, our worship team sang it in my church on Sunday a couple weeks ago, and I was like, this song is amazing. Number six, would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? <laughs> right. Speak every language in the world. Why? Well, I'm headed to Davos, Switzerland next week to moderate a panel at the World Economic Forum. And this panel will gather people from literally all over the world. And I would love to just be able to converse with everyone at any moment. I think, you know, that that would just be incredible. And people are so kind to always learn English. We're so lucky that, you know, most people know English. But I would love to be able to just speak everyone's language so they can, you know, really share what they want to say. You know what I mean? Infinitely lingual. That would be cool. That would totally be cool. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Number seven, what's your favorite holiday? Christmas. 100% Christmas. Decorations go up November 1st, and they are still up at our house. Okay. (laughs) Got it. Number, (laughs) Number eight, how long does it take for you to get ready? I have it down to a science. I would say 20, 25 minutes. I oftentimes have to do my hair and makeup in an airport bathroom if I'm traveling for the show. I have gotten ready for red carpet. 
in the backstage bathroom of a theater on Click 2025. So if your producer knocked on the door right now and said, hey, we need you on set, how fast could you get ready? I could get ready in 10 because I already have my hair and makeup basically done. So it would just be a touch up. Got it. Okay. Number nine, scale of one to 10. How good of a driver are you? I'm a 10, baby. I'm really good. Well, when my husband and I were dating, I had to back out of a long driveway at a home that we were at in Houston, Texas. And he was so impressed with how I just backed out of this winding driveway in his truck, no less, in his massive big Ford truck. So I think I'm pretty good. (laughs) All right. Very good. All right. Number 10. And I think you've actually met her, so you'll probably be able to do this well. Complete this sentence. Taylor Swift is... A modern-day Madonna. You interviewed her, yes? Yeah. I just think she is so smart in how she's marketed herself, not just in country music, but in pop music, too. She writes her own music. She's such a great collaborator. She's a marketing genius. I just see her as a modern-day Madonna. She's gonna. I, I believe she will stand the test of time, and like a Madonna or a Cher, she'll continue to be popular You know, decades from now. And very nice girl. Sweet girl. That's what I hear. That's what I hear. Well, hey, congratulations. You're off the hot seat. You answered the 10 questions. Thanks for doing that. You bet. That was so fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're welcome. Well, I know, hey, I know that you've uh, you've probably got a show to do here uh, uh, today, so I know you need to get going. So thanks for the time today and really appreciate it. And uh, I just wish you the best of luck in your career. And like I told you before the podcast, I'd love to catch up uh, after this and, and chat independently and talk more about TV. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to today's episode, everybody, and thanks to Megan Alexander for the time. And if you enjoyed it, please subscribe. You could do so on Spotify, iTunes, the podcast app, Google Play, or YouTube, or you can just go to lifeafterthecrown.com. And for weekly podcast updates, just follow me on Instagram, at Tim Tialdo. Until next time, remember the words of Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. See you next week, everybody.